Today our scripture reading is in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 11. When I was a child, I used to speak as a child, think as a child, reason as a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. God have a blessing for us reading his word. Good morning, everyone. Um, this is actually my last Sabbath here before I go back for my second year of school. So um, this song I sang before last year, about a year ago, um, when I was leaving before. So um, I hope it's a blessing. It's a song that uh, Jason Maloney, Stephen Stewart, and I worked on together, and it's called When We Believe. Close my eyes and call to you, reaching out in prayer, asking just what I should do. I wonder if you're there. I pray for understanding, I offer thanks and praise. I ask for health and happiness, your friendship all my days. When we believe, when we bend our knees and pray, when we call his name, his light will lead the way. When Things you've never known when we pray without ceasing when we when we believe you always seem to show yourself seem dark to me when my heart goes dim and hope is weak you part the stormy seas i pray for understanding i offer thanks and praise i ask for health and happiness Friendship all my days. When we believe, when we bend our knees and pray, when we call His name, His light will lead the way. When we believe, things you've never known. Ceasing when we, when we believe, when we believe, he'll tell you great and hidden things, things you never. Without ceasing, you'll never be alone. No, we'll never be alone. When we believe, when we bend our knees and pray, when we call His name, His light will lead.
Thank you, Malik. Uh, as, as you came up along with your uh, fellow college students, I was uh, remembering how small you were when you first came and I first uh, knew you. Uh, also, uh, Joshua Jones, thank you for the children's story. We're still on with uh, children, uh, AYS tonight, uh, this afternoon? Okay, at five o'clock. Uh, I was able to attend uh, two weeks ago and if you can come out uh, this afternoon at 5 o'clock, you will be blessed, I guarantee you. He uh, uh, does a great job leading out there. A good time to turn off your cell phone if you have it on. But I want to uh, just uh, read to you a uh, message I received from Pastor uh, and Sonia Vasquez uh, yesterday. Greetings. We thank you for your prayers. We have looked at several houses and are close to choosing one. We anticipate to move and arrive in Fredericksburg around the 23rd of September to the 25th. If everything turns out the way it should, continue to keep us in your prayers, Pastor Sonia, uh, Pastor uh, Jose and Sonia. So I just wanted to give you that uh, little bit of an update. Um, they, are, uh, they are coming. Let's continue to pray for their ministry as they come. Um, I'd like you to go on a trip with me. Uh, it's to a place that is by a river. It's uh, luscious. Uh, wheat fields and trees. Uh, bread basket of the world. Absolutely. Um, in fact, it's, it's so productive that um, the, uh, the people that live there are, um, they're actually prejudiced against shepherds because sheep eat grain and they're actually prejudiced and so they separate them into a separate uh, state, country of Goshen. It is not what we see now of Egypt. It's not dry, dusty sand. It is luscious like you cannot imagine. And try to think of it that way in your mind. Because that is the country that Moses grew up in. It was a country that was very productive, the breadbasket of the world. And you remember last time I spoke with you, we talked about the basket boat, the, the little ark of safety that saved him. Well, he has grown. He's uh, been in the, the school with his mother until about 12 years old, and he moves to the palace where his adopted mother, the princess of Egypt, is. He goes to school. He learns military tactics. He learns political activities. He uh, learns all there is to know in the public schools of Egypt until he's 40 years old but always in his heart, he is, um, he remembers the lessons that he learned at his mother's knee. And he is always in his heart with his people. He uh, actually goes out and, and watches what's going on the taskmasters abusing his fellows. And 
inside of him grows resentment. Resentment of uh, the, the way his people have been treated and also during the same time angels of God have been visiting him and instructing him that he's actually supposed to be the deliverer of Israel. In fact, not only have they been tell, the angels been telling him, but they've also been telling the leaders of the Israelite people there in Egypt that Moses is the one. Think about what the decree was for to kill the baby, the, the male babies, when Moses was saved in his basket boat. Now, I don't believe there were, uh, that they were all killed, but I believe some were. And so this was a population that was very, uh, was diminished, and Moses was a unique one. And uh, he broods in his heart that resentment. He dwells on it. He thinks about it. He sees the treatment of his people. And one day, I believe it was at sunrise, because he had planned this. And he had thought about it. He had dwelt on it. So he planned it at a time when there wouldn't be a lot of people. And so I believe it was a sunrise. You could make many, many arguments at other times. But I believe this was a sunrise. And he went out. The sun wasn't up yet. And he saw an Egyptian taskmaster abusing one of his fellow Israelites. And he was so angered and he was so trained that he went to that taskmaster and he killed him. He murdered him in cold blood. Let's pray. Father in heaven, please instruct us today if, of our own hearts. Instruct us as to what you would have us to do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I pride myself in being able to fix just about anything. Uh, obviously, that's not true. I particularly am not good with electronics, although uh, I have been able to trace down some problems with electrical in cars. But uh, about 20 years ago... Um, uh, I, I was, uh, we were in our home on Wilderness Lane, and uh, one morning I got up and went to do laundry, and I opened up the washing machine, and there were carrot peelings in my washing machine. Well, uh, we all know that water flows down. Well, the washing machine was above the basement, and we had what is known as a ejection pump. And that is uh, ejection pump. We actually have one here at the church. Our, our uh, sewer field is over not too far from the playground, and we're below that downstairs. And so there's a pump that fills up a well. Uh, the, the sewage goes in there, and then it is pumped up to the, the other holding tanks. Well, we had this situation in our home on Wilderness Lane. And the night before, we had had uh, carrots and, uh, and potatoes, and we had peelings. And uh, I opened up the dishwasher, or the, the washing machine, and there were carrot peelings in, that, uh, in there. And I had no idea how that happened. Well, I worked on the plumbing, and I worked on the plumbing, and I could not figure it out, so I had to call in a professional. And sometimes we as humans get uh, our hearts, get clogged up, things that aren't supposed to be there, and we need to call in professionals sometimes. Well, I had to call in the professional, and he brought his, uh, his uh, 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 automatic snake. It had a motor on it, and he snaked that pipe. And uh, he felt like he got, got to the problem, and he pulled it out, and uh, turns out it was a washcloth. My son, of four years old at that time, uh, had, uh, you know, the little kids' washcloths, they're smaller. It had gone down, 
the drain and clogged up the, uh, the entire house. And so uh, when that ejection pump went off, uh, it tried to go out, but it went up in. We got it clean and it was no problem. But sometimes in our own hearts, things that should just drain away, we shouldn't uh, worry about or things that happen to us, they should just drain away, there's a block. And sometimes we need to call in the professionals. We all have things happen to us. I know that I personally am deeply flawed by sin. I'm scarred horribly. And if I took off my suit and I took off all of my armor, you would see that I am very scarred, and I know you are too. We're beat up every day by life. But like Moses, in his resentment, as he dwelt on that, we all are capable of just about anything, if you're honest with yourself. We are capable of just about anything. For him, it was murder. I think it was premeditated murder. But we are all capable of just about anything. If you have your Bibles with, with you, and uh, if you don't, there's one in the pew in front of you, I'd like you to turn to 1 Corinthians 13. First Corinthians 13, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. You've heard this so many times, and so have I. The noise, it's just noise if we don't have love. If I have the gift of prophecy, if I'm the smartest guy in the room and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have the faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I'm the leader of community services and I give all of my possessions to the poor and give every, uh, give, even give my body to whatever hardship it can be, that I, might, uh, that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. You know, this is, it, it, it's, it's talking to us, but this is describing who God is. Do you know that wherever you are, whatever you're doing, God loves you with this kind of love? He loves you, loves you, loves you. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're a murderer. It doesn't matter what you have done. God loves you. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are, t there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put away the ways of childhood. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now... These three remain, 
faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Do we really, really, really understand that God does not care about any of that stuff except for the love? Do you get that? That passage is telling us it takes a while to get there, but He doesn't care about how smart I am. He doesn't care about anything except for love and how I love other people because I am His ambassador. What is my motive? What is my motive? The motive of my mind. Turn, if you will, over to Philippians uh, chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Therefore, beginning in verse 2, or verse 1, I'm sorry. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, that's you and me being Christians, if any comfort from His love, if any, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in the Spirit of one mind, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility. Value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mind that was in Christ Jesus, who, being in the nat very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearances of a man, he humbled himself. Humbled himself. By becoming obedient to death, even the death of the cross. That's for you and me. That's the only thing that makes this possible today is that he was willing to completely and utterly make the motive of his mind love. Have I told you about my dream? My goal? That when anybody ever drives on or walks on this campus and meets you and me, that they are so cared for, so loved, so introduced to Christ that they cannot stay away. That we cannot stay away. Isn't that really what this scripture is saying? It's a motive of the mind of God, of love. Now Moses, when he murdered the Egyptian, he uh, quickly buried the guy in the sand, and the only two people that knew about that was Moses and the Israelite that was there. The next day the same type of thing happened uh, except for it was two Israelites fighting. One was clearly wrong, one was clearly in the right, and Moses came up to him and said, come on guys, you're brothers, what are you doing? And the one guy that was in the wrong turned to him and said, yeah, what right do you have to tell me? Are you going to murder me like you did that other guy? he became aware that his action had been revealed. Not only did this Israelite say this to Moses, but he became aware, Moses did, that even Pharaoh knew about the situation and he ran. 
He ran into the wilderness. He was 40 years old. He uh, came to uh, a watering hole where Jethro's daughters uh, were watering their sheep. And uh, he drove away some, some other shepherds and watered the sheep. And Jethro sa said to his daughters, why didn't you invite him home? They went out, they got him, and, and uh, Moses ended up marrying one of the, the, uh, the daughters. And 40 years pass. Moses in the wilderness tending sheep with his family. And we come to another morning. It's even before dawn. Moses, he gets up, he puts on his clothes quietly so he doesn't disturb his wife laying there next to him. Pulls back the tent flap, goes out, goes into the corral where the sheep are, and he leads the sheep into the wilderness. Now, uh, there's no evidence. I just think it happened this way because I don't know of a farmer alive who doesn't get up before sunrise. And he goes out and he takes the sheep into the wilderness to the mountain of God, Mount Horeb. And he's there tending the sheep, beginning to, as they're doing their things. And he looks and he sees a bush. Now, I believe it was cool, the cool of the day, because um, who in their right mind in the desert is going to go towards a fire in the heat of the day? That's one of the reasons why I think this is early morning. A time when a fire is intriguing. It's interesting. It draws my attention. And so he sees over there a fire. And as he gets near, he sees that this fire is the entire bush. And it's not being consumed. Moses spends a lot of time in sunrises, I think. And not only that, but God tends to meet us at sunrise. And so he draws near to the bush, and there's a voice that comes from the bush. And it says, stop right there. Take off your shoes, because you're on holy ground. What more holy is there for us than love. It's the motivation of God's mind that drove him not only to create us, to make this wonderful place that is so marred by sin, but is yet still so lovely. What more holy is love? He says, Take off your shoes. Because you're on holy ground. And they begin to, God begins to talk to Moses and says, Now, you know, back there, I know about you murdering that Egyptian. I know about that. But see, you weren't ready to lead my people yet. And now, after 40 years of tending sheep, you're now ready. The time is ready. Your heart has been changed. The motives of your mind have been changed from resentment and, and pride to humbleness. Humbleness. Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. What is the difference in the motive of Moses' mind when he killed the Egyptian 
and when he met God at the burning bush. What is the difference? Moses has been changed. He has been educated, truly educated. Carolyn talked to us, and Carolyn, thank you so very much for those, those uh, bags uh, leading out in that. I know a lot of us uh, uh, participated in, in getting those things together, but it's a wonderful, it was a wonderful thing for us to see all of our young people and, and uh, teachers and everybody up here. What is the motive there? The motive is pure and simple love. What is the difference between Moses killing the Egyptian and Moses at the burning bush? Once upon a time, there was a man who was a carpenter. This man became very good at his craft, a master craftsman. As his reputation grew, more and more people began to trust his work. Not only trust it, but admire it. He became known as the best carpenter in town. Unfortunately, being very good at something doesn't always make a person wealthy. And that was the case with this man. He had worked his entire life in a very serving way. One morning at breakfast, his wife planted a seed in his head. She asked him if he had given any thought to retirement. Like, like most people, who love what they do, retirement wasn't something he had thought about. But the seed that had been planted in his mind began to grow and twisted the way he saw himself. On the way to work that morning, he started thinking, you know, I don't have that much to show for my success. Oh, I can look around this town and see the beautiful homes that I have crafted and the appreciation of those for whom I have worked. Obviously, because I stay very busy, I'm able to provide jobs for others too, but I am not rich. I should be rich. This carpenter, this craftsman, had started to let his mind have a wrong motive. He was letting his mind be conniving. When we are, allow our minds to be conniving, we start to live too much in ourselves. This is what he was doing. This was his plot. I've got to make more money. People trust me. They admire me. And I need to start thinking about me more. That afternoon, he went to the work site where he had several homes under construction. One of the richest men in town approached the master craftsman and said, do you know how much you are admired in this town? Not thinking with a pure motive, he didn't hear that. He correlated admiration with being a servant. He was thinking of be, being subservient. Servant. That's when it happened. That's when his mind conceived the thought. The rich man continued, I want you to build me a home. I bought a tract of land on top of the mountain, and I want you to build for me the most beautiful home in town. Price is no object. I want the finest of materials and I want your finest crew. The men whom this town admires as master builders to build this home. I'm going to be out of the country doing some extensive traveling and wanted it, won't be back for four months. 
Would it be possible for you to have the home completed at the end of that time frame? Of course, the builder said. Yes, he thought. Here's my chance to make some money, a chance to build my own prosperity. And he put his plan into action. He didn't buy the finest materials. He bought substandard, and he charged for the finest. He didn't use his best craftsmen, and whatever mistakes were made, they were plastered over and painted. All the things that were done wrong were not seen. Four months went by, and the project was completed. The rich man pulled up in front of the house, and as was customary for the master builder, he showed the man through his new home. He talked about the details. He talked about the special care that had been taken, knowing in his heart that it wasn't so. He talked about the craftsmanship, but he knew it was substandard. Walking to the door of the mansion, the craftsman laid the keys in the hand of the rich man and said, and said Welcome to your home. A huge smile spread across the rich man's face. He put the keys back into the builder's hand and said, My friend, you have been a giver to our community. A man who has been faithful, never caring once for his own gain, but only watching out for the good of others. No, my friend, this is not my home. This is yours. No, my friend, this is not my home. This is yours. This is your home. What motives motivate you? Because truly, this is where you live. This is where I live. What do you allow yourself to get away with? What do you steal? Are you conniving? Are you greedy? Could you be resentful that someone has something that you feel you deserve? Oh yes, it's plastered over and painted. But when you are quiet, when you are still, you know. What words do you say that should never be said? What gossip do you share that should never be shared? No, my friend, this is not my home. This is yours. Stand, stand and sing with us our closing hymn, Jesus is Coming Again.
Francisco.